Do you remember as a child dreaming of being something, a pilot or magician, astronomer, basketball player, all the stuff of many childhood dreams and relatively few adult realities? Right now, all the two- and four-year-old sons of my friends are set on becoming firefighters and policemen. I expect archaeologist and astronaut will probably come around soon as their interests evolve toward dinosaurs and space. My own childhood dreams were pretty down-to-earth. For a while, I wanted to be a lawyer, because I thought that meant I would have a gorgeous wood-paneled office. Mostly, though, with that one short, brief exception. Since I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a writer. In fifth grade, I started a class newspaper, and from then on, journalism was what I did. More than that, it was who I was. First a copy editor, then a page designer, and throughout the 12 years I spent as a journalist, section editor, reporter, and columnist, too. From the time we're children, it seems we're programmed to identify what we do as who we are. It's just as true for adults, whether what we do is the work that we do to make money and care for our families, or the way we spend our hours outside of work, making music or building masterpieces from wood or clay. What we do is often parenting. The identity of mother or father supersedes all that came before and anything that might come after, with the possible exception of grandma and grandpa. Who we are and what we do are inextricably linked. Ministers often speak of our profession as a calling, sometimes rather snidely, unfortunately. My Jewish and Christian friends speak of God calling them to ministry despite their fervent attempts to avoid it. From before the time of Jonah and Jesus, those who would preach the gospel have long had a habit of denying the will of their God. When I once expressed doubt about whether I, of all people, should become a minister, a friend of mine who is an Episcopal priest assured me that the God he believed in would much rather have to twist someone's arm a little bit than have someone too eager to speak on behalf of the divine. (laughs) For me, ministry has always felt less like a calling and more like a nudging. I didn't feel the universe calling me toward ministry. I looked at other possibilities on my path out of journalism. I thought I could be a media person for a nonprofit, social worker, psychologist. But none of them was quite right. I never dreamed of being a minister until it became clear that it was the one career path that would allow me to do what I want to do and be who I want to be in the world. At its root, this is what calling is about. Being who you most want to be and doing what you most want to do. Writer and theologian Frederick Beekner writes, Vocation is the place where our deep gladness meets the world's deep need. As I once learned the word vocation for a vocabulary test, it's what we get paid to do. But before that, It's defined as a strong feeling of suitability for a particular career or occupation. Most importantly, the root of the word vocation is from the Latin word meaning to call. My vocation, if I'm lucky, may well be what I do every day, what I'm paid to do. It may also be what I choose to do with my downtime, the work I feel called to do because it's there that my deep gladness meets the world's deep need. What's beautiful about this is that there are so many kinds of calling, so many vocations, and so many different kinds of people to fill those callings and those vocations. Often we think of jobs like nursing and teaching as callings, and certainly they are, but they aren't the only ones. I sincerely hope that the men who pick up my garbage and take care of our water and sewer lines, do so because they take pride in keeping our community clean and free from disease. Any work we do can be a calling if we feel it is, whether we're garbage collectors or college professors. 
One of my grandmothers was a beautician who got joy from giving women hairdos that made them feel pretty. That was her calling. My other grandma was, as she called herself, a mailman, and she loved delivering letters and cards to people because she brought joy to people when she gave them letters and cards. To follow our calling, we must believe, as the L'Oreal ads say, I'm worth it. Just as our children and their future are worth it, so too is every one of us already in adulthood. However old we may be, as long as we are breathing, it is not too late to follow our bliss in whatever ways we're able. If I'm a dancer but can no longer dance, I can still watch others dance, maybe teach them, and share my stories about what dancing has meant in my own life. When I began seminary, it was only with the hindsight of having decided what I wanted to do with myself professionally that the path to get to ministry became clear. The universe and I had been figuring out what I was meant to do and how I might best serve the world, and it was only when the decision had been made that the path to get there became abundantly clear. As mythologist Joseph Campbell wrote, If you can see your path laid out in front of you step by step, it's not your path. (laughs) Your own path you make with every step you take. That's why it's your path, he said. Seeking and pursuing your call, your path, is not an easy thing. It's much easier to follow an already broken trail, one that's readily visible, than it is to hack your way through the brambles of life. To follow your call, wherever it comes from, wherever it sends you, you have to be brave. Because we aren't always rewarded for following our call, for pursuing that dream. Often our culture, whether in the form of parents, co-workers, even beloved partners and spouses, tell us we have to shut up, put our heads down, and go to work to pay the bills. Certainly there's an element of truth here. There are bills to pay and daycare to get to and pay for. And we have to believe that doing what is most satisfying to our souls is the right thing to do. As we struggle to follow our call, the words of Joseph Campbell once again ring true. His advice is simple. Follow your bliss. Find where it is and don't be afraid to follow it. When we follow our bliss, good things happen, not only for us, but for our families and communities. Campbell said, if you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while, waiting. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. When you can see that, you begin to meet people who are in your field of bliss, and they open doors to you. I say, follow your bliss and don't be afraid, and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be. When we follow our bliss, when we answer our call, we find in ourselves a baseline contentment, even as we continue to deal with the day-to-day nonsense everyone has to deal with. We become kinder because our hearts are less troubled. It's easier to be good to others when we're good to ourselves by finding and following our call. The Wiccan Reed offers similar advice to Campbell's and adds that we must remember the effect we have on others. The end of it goes, and ye harm none, do what ye will. It too is a simple instruction to follow your bliss with the reminder that we must do our best to ensure following our bliss doesn't harm others. The Joseph Campbell Foundation wants us to know he thought the same. The Foundation's website says, Following one's bliss, as Campbell saw it, isn't merely a matter of doing whatever you like and certainly not doing simply as you are told. It is a matter of identifying that pursuit which you are truly passionate about 
and attempting to give yourself absolutely to it. In so doing, you will find your fullest potential and serve your community to the greatest possible extent. We can't, with integrity, tell our children they can be and do anything they want while we sit trapped in unhappiness. We all know our kids are too smart to settle for that. They'll ask why you stay in an exhausting job that sucks away your spirit as well as your time when really you want to be making pottery. Kids will call our bluff every time and thank goodness for it. It's unfair of us adults to expect children to follow their bliss if we don't have the guts to follow our own and model that for them. So following those final words of the Wiccan reed becomes difficult. And ye harm none, do what ye will. We have to weigh our own happiness and well-being with that of others and trust that a decision for our well-being is the right one and that those who may be saddened by it will eventually understand. Calling is what we make it. We know when we aren't in the right place. The hard part is getting to the right place. Because following your heart sometimes means hurting other people even when you don't want to and don't intend to. During seminary, I saw several long-time marriages and partnerships disintegrate because of the demands it puts on us to be true to ourselves. The difficulty of achieving our calling is what requires us to believe in something that will fuel our passion and feed our call. Believe that a divine force in the universe is calling you to knit, write, or build statues from Legos. Believe that your children's lives will be better if they see you content. Believe that you can only serve as a good example for your grandchildren if they see you, a grown-up, following your own bliss. Believe, as the 1933 Humanist Manifesto says, that the purpose of human life is the complete realization of human personality. Or believe, as the 1973 Humanist Manifesto too says, human life has meaning because we create and develop our futures. Happiness and the creative realization of human needs and desires, individually and in shared enjoyment, are continuous themes of humanism. We strive for the good life here and now. The goal is to pursue life's enrichment despite debasing forces of vulgarization, commercial, commercialization, and dehumanization. Believe something. Believe in yourself. In Peter Pan, Peter tells Wendy that to get to his home Neverland, you have to go toward the second star to the right and straight on till morning. And though I would love to say I remember this quote from Peter Pan, it was actually from the mouth of Captain James T. Kirk in Star Trek VI that I first remember hearing it. But whether it's directions to Neverland or the next bearing for the Starship Enterprise, those words, second star to the right and straight on till morning, they offer up promise, adventure, and the idea of being called toward something mysterious, something wondrous. It's an idea we loved when we read it as kids and still seek as adults, or else why would Captain Kirk have made that reference? All too often, grown-ups seem to have lost our wonder and joy about life, seem to have left it behind somewhere on the path to adulthood. All too often, we speak of obligations rather than desires or dreams or fulfillment. In the process, we silence the very voice calling us to be our truest selves. When we aren't able to make a living by pursuing our call, 
We say we don't have time to take that class or write that novel that's been rolling around in our head for years. We forget that Neverland is out there if we just follow those directions. And if buying that Neverland is out there is a step too far for you, how about this? We forget that Neverland might, it could, be out there if we bothered looking to that second star to the right. So my plea to each of you, however old or young you are, is to look for Neverland, your Neverland. Look to the stars. Believe in something, be it science, a goddess, a tree, a person, a cat, simply the beating of your own heart. Move toward your passion, whether it's the work you get paid for or the hobby you couldn't live if you didn't do. You'll find that the time you thought you didn't have suddenly opens up when you seek your joy. That time becomes essential because it feeds your spirit. It becomes part of your routine because you realize it's such an integral part of who you are. Take Annie Dillard's advice to grasp your one necessity and don't let it go. Dangle from it limp wherever it takes you. Time spent becoming exhausted doing what you love is Kairos time. Time not measured by the Earth's movement around the sun, but the sacred time in which everything happens as it should. Kairos time is time in which you lose yourself completely to art or computer coding or reading to children. Kairos is time that stands still and allows you to be in the present fully in a way we rarely are. Whatever your passion, whatever your bliss, pursue it. If you don't know what it is, look for it. If you don't know how to work toward it, ask someone for help. In the cosmic scheme of things, our human lives are far too short not to strive for contentment and delight. We make time into Kairos time when we seek our delight. And there is just too much suffering in the world not to counter it with deep satisfaction in who we are and how we spend our days. Brazilian Archbishop Dom Helder Camara once said, be careful how you live your life, for it is the only gospel others will read. May the gospel of our lives be one in which all who read it find a thirst for life, a passionate drive toward calling, and a continual move toward fulfillment of our vocations. May it tell the story of a people who still look for Neverland, who listen for their calling, and who follow their bliss. May it be so. Amen.